okay good morning everybody today's lecture is going to be on uh, conservative forces okay so uh, in the last lecture we saw uh, elastic potential energy uh, we took the condition of the spring and we said uh, you can stretch the spring and uh, there will be a restoring force that will be generated and uh, we can find what was the value of the uh, work that was uh, required to stretch the spring and alternatively we said that uh, the work of the spring is going to be negative of the work that somebody has to do in stretching the spring okay and we had derived this expression one half kx square and this was specifically for your uh, potential energy that was uh, being uh, developed in the spring okay so the work done is the negative of the change in the potential energy of the system uh, this potential energy uh, it uh, belongs to the entire system and not just to the individual objects that are present in the system okay so uh, let's look at the uh, example the question that we are going to solve is we have to find the work done in pulling a spring okay and we are going to pull the spring from 20 centimeters to 0 centimeters okay so this work done is going to be the work done by the spring okay so it's not going to be the work that uh, i have to do okay so uh, and we have been given that this spring has a spring constant of 500 newtons per meter and remember work done by the spring uh, is uh, again uh, you have to st stretch it between uh, two positions x1 and x2 and that is just force times the displacement and we know that the uh, force of the spring is uh, minus kx and x1 to x2 is the position and you are doing dx and if you do that you get minus k x square by 2 and then you have to evaluate between x1 and x2 all right so we had uh, minus 500 divided by 2 and you have x2 square minus x1 square and so that is minus it divided by 2 and then x2 position is 0 and so you get 0 minus and we have 0 0.2 and that will be square and so you have a minus and a minus so they will cancel and so you get uh, your value of uh, plus 500 divided by 2 times 0 0.4 and that is 10 joules okay excellent so that is the work done by the spring it should be a positive value so uh, until now we have looked at uh, these cases of uh, your spring and your gravitational uh, force and your uh, uh, other cases as well uh, which will come up later in the course uh, like uh, we might have electric force or uh, magnetic force so uh, we need to characterize them in a in a much formal way and uh, one way to look at these forces is by classifying them as whether they are conservative or non conservative forces okay and by definition a conservative force is a force in which the work done by the force it depends only on the initial and the final conditions okay and it does not depend on the path taken between the initial and the final positions of the mass right so remember we were talking about work done is force times displacement so there is a displacement term there and what we are saying is that we only care about the initial and the final positions we don't care about uh, the path of that displacement okay and for such conservative forces you can have the potential energy and you can uh, define a potential energy for the forces okay and uh, you might uh, have uh, already guessed uh, if there is conservative forces there are non conservative forces and in this non conservative forces the work done by the force actually depends on the path taken between the initial and the final positions of the mass okay and in such cases you will not be able to define a potential energy for the force right and a common example of non conservative force is friction okay you have probably have never heard about what is the potential energy of friction right friction is just a force and there is no potential energy or kinetic energy of friction right so again so this is the major classification so in today's lecture we want to understand a little bit about how these forces come into play how we can check whether a force is conservative or not so what are the conditions that would define what a conservative force is okay so you can take the example of gravity right so in the left you have a case where an object is just going in the y direction okay and we know and we talked about it last time that uh, if i uh, move the object from this lower position to the higher position and the difference between the height is h 
then the work done is MGH, right? So uh, again, if you look at another condition and say that uh, again you are changing the height in the y-axis by h, but now you are not moving in a straight line, but you are moving uh, at a diagonal line as shown here in the orange curve. Okay. So again, at any instant when this object is moving, the force of gravity, right, is always acting in the direction of this pink arrow as it is shown here. Okay. And then once you do the dot product, you will realize that in the end, you always get that the work done is just MGH, right? And so it doesn't matter whether you're going in a straight line or you take a, a, a path that is uh, uh, shown like here, as long as the, the distance moved is um, H, then that's the only thing that matters. And so you can imagine that the gravity is a case where it is a conservative force, okay? And uh, you can look at more examples like these, your conditions for A, B, C, and D. And in all these conditions, the displacement is H, right? And the force acting is always in the direction as shown by this red arrow, okay? And so for all these cases, the work done by the gravity is always M G H, okay? Because suppose in case B, you are moving from this uh, right direction to the left. There is no work done by the by the gravity in moving it from uh, this location to here. So it is just uh, M G H, okay? So again, the important concept is that uh, it only depends on the initial position and the final position. That's all you care about. And uh, any path you take between these two positions, if the force is conservative, right? It is independent of that path, okay? And uh, gravity, the gravitational force is an example of a conservative force, okay? And that's why for conservative force like gravity, we, we have a term which is we call gravitational potential energy, like we were discussing last time, right? At the surface of the Earth, the gravitational potential energy is essentially uh, depending on the uh, distance uh, moved by the object uh, close to the surface of the Earth, okay? And... Uh, there is an alternative definition for conservative forces, and uh, it is uh, it goes by this that the force is conservative if the net work done by the force on object moving around any closed path is zero. Okay, and you can understand that uh, by thinking uh, about what we were just discussing. So, if you are moving from from one to point two along path A. And if you're moving from uh, one to two along path B, since the initial and the final position is the same, then the, if it is a conservative force, then uh, essentially we have that uh, the work done should be the same, okay, independent of the path. And with the same uh, reasoning, if I move from one to two along path A, and then I move from two to one along path B, then I end up in the same position around the circle. And if I move around the circle in the same position, that means my displacement is zero. So my work done should be zero, right? Because there is net, no net displacement happening in this case. Right? And so every any time an object is moving around a closed path, right? The the net work done will be zero, and that essentially tells us that it is a conservative force or not. Okay. Uh, look at some of the examples of uh, conservative and non-conservative forces, right? So you have uh, your gravity is a conservative force, the elastic uh, potential energy that we were talking about in, in terms of spring. So that is a conservative force as well, as long as the spring is uh, an ideal spring, okay? So we have to understand that if you stress the spring too much, then uh, the material can get deformed and it won't come back to its original shape. And in that case, the Hooke's law will not hold and uh, it will not be an ideal spring. So only when the spring is ideal spring, we can say that the force exerted by the spring is conservative, okay? And your electric force, again, is conservative. So uh, you will be dealing with these forces again and again later on in your, in your course. And so you should be uh, comfortable with the topic, okay? And uh, some examples of non-conservative forces are friction, and air resistance, uh, motion where your, your motor is involved and there is rocket propulsion. So there is always heat loss in this case. And uh, even a push and a pull by a person, these are examples of non-conservative forces, okay? And uh, like we were discussing, for all of these forces, there is no potential energy term that you can uh, define, okay? So pendulum is also a non-conservative force. 
so uh, again just like we were talking about uh, the spring within some limits is conservative the pendulum within some limits is is a conservative force okay so uh, for uh, pendulums what we do is we have to remember that the angle that we are giving for the pendulum to swing has to be very very small okay and only under those conditions basically uh, it is a good approximation of uh, a conservative uh, restoring force being generated because in the pendulum what is happening there is gravitational force acting right so uh, the, and gravity is a conservative force however there is the, the the mass that is moving and it is feeling some air resistance and of course there is the the tension on the uh, string as well so under those conditions when there is this air uh, resistance is there and when the string uh, has some mass through which the bob is attached and the string is getting stretched so there is displacement you know at the atomic level you can think you know if there is a uh, a thread and you are trying to stretch the thread at an atomic level there are some atoms that are getting stretched okay to certain extent and if you keep stretching the string it will break right so so uh, the forces that are uh, holding the string together again so those are also coming into play so uh, what we have realized is that uh, when you are doing the pendulum motion if you keep the angle of the uh, deviation of the pendulum very very small then to a large extent it is a good approximation of the simple harmonic motion and uh, your air resistance and uh, your uh, other non conservative forces don't come into play okay but it is a very very small window so you have to be within like 2 to 3 degrees of deviation from your from your uh, equilibrium position okay and the more angle you give to the pendulum and more and more of these non conservative effects will come into play okay uh, time and time again in physics you have to realize that you know we are doing lot of approximations right and uh, uh, we are taking uh, examples of simplistic systems and trying to uh, understand what is going on in nature or what is going on in a specific uh, material and so on so uh, those things will be valid only to certain extent okay and uh, you have to know the conditions under which they are valid and you can use them right so uh, in future when whether you are in a work environment or whether you are doing research or any project so you have to know where you can apply which model which theory so that uh, you don't end up using a, a wrong uh, assumption and uh, you know reaching to some conclusion that was not valid for your specific case okay so you can imagine that if you are moving an object from your position 1 to position 2 and uh, the distance traveled here is uh, is in a straight line so you will require less amount of work that you have to do in moving this uh, uh, this object between these two positions however if you are going in this uh, semi circular path then you are fo you are following a, a longer trajectory and so the the path taken is longer so you will have to put in more and more effort right because if the friction Uh, on this floor is exactly the same everywhere so uh, it would matter whether you are moving just in a straight line or you are whether you are taking a different path right so ideally you would like to take the shortest path so that you have to uh, use a little amount of energy right so so friction is a force which depends on the path taken okay so if you take the straight line then you will have to do uh, less amount of energy spent in uh, counteracting this friction if you if you go in the circular path and you are pushing in the same instance then uh, you know you will have to require more amount of energy okay so it depends on the path taken all right so the position of the object that we have been talking about and uh, the potential energy that develops in the object because of the uh, position that it holds right so we have looked at very specific case of your uh, gravitational potential energy and we have looked at the case of your uh, spring but now we want to generalize this case right because there are other forces in nature and so how do we define this concept of potential energy for any situation maybe there are some charges present so we want to find the potential energy created by this electric uh, bunch of charges okay so the standard definition for potential energy and i have called it as a potential energy function so you can differentiate between when we are just calling something potential energy okay so this potential energy function uh, we define it as the work done to restore a particle from its present position to a standard position r0 okay 
so essentially what we are saying is uh, if there is any potential energy uh, of in a particle at a certain position the amount of potential energy at that position to the amount of work to put that material in that position or the particle in that position okay and uh, previously we were discussing that we have chosen the surface of the earth to be this uh, position where your potential is zero and uh, from that reference point if you move it to some other position like h then you know it's mgh the simplistic example right so now universally we are looking at this uh, situation and we are saying where should we choose this uh, standard position r0 okay from where we will always measure this uh, potential energy okay and so we have to define this zero right and uh, a way to look at it is when you are talking about gravitational force or your electric forces they uh, both are basically dependent on 1 over r square right the position term right you have g m1 m2 by r square and in, in, even in electric force you have kq by r square so so this 1 over r square term right as r is increasing that value will go down and down and it will eventually go to zero as r is going to infinity okay so if you are looking at uh, gravity uh, acting on an object at a very very far position from where you are right so essentially you are not uh, giving any gravitational force to the object because the distance is very very far away okay so that's how we try to define uh, the standard position that uh, let's assume that at infinity from uh, let's say earth right this force that is acting on an object whether it is gravitational force or electric force will be zero right and hence the potential energy at infinity is zero okay so if you look at the uh, formula that we say the potential energy u will be equal to uh, your integral of r to r zero right your present position is r and you want to uh, move it to a standard position r zero and so the work done would be your f dot dr right the force that is required to move the object from r to r zero right so again we are uh, universally taking that r zero the standard position will be at infinity so you can just replace this r zero here to infinity okay and so your expression will become u is equal to integral of r to infinity f dot dr okay and if you change the um, terms from r to infinity and in inverse them then you will have a negative sign okay so you can also write that uh, u is uh, minus of infinity to r f dot dr okay so just like we were saying before if you are moving an object from zero position that is surface of the earth to some height h then it is zero to h and f dot uh, dr right now we are saying that the zero position is infinity okay so now it will be infinite uh, integral of infinity to r f dot dr okay so this is the way of uh, defining the potential energy for any case okay so it's a universally applied uh, situation and universally applied formula okay so it's uh, it's important to understand that uh, we have taken this convention that uh, the potential energy uh, at infinity is going to be zero and infinity means that the r position from where you are looking at the particle is is very very large so so essentially there is no effect happening at that far away position okay whether it is the effect from electric forces whether it is the effect from gravitational forces or some other force that uh, you might think of so um, it applies to all of them okay so uh, alternatively you can say that the potential energy of the particle at the position r is given by the amount of work done in moving it from infinity to that point okay we can use this uh, potential energy function and um, we can try to uh, develop a relationship between the force and the potential energy function okay so so let's try to do that uh, in the general case u will be minus of infinity to r f dot dr okay and we are saying that f here is a conservative force right because only for conservative forces you can define this potential energy term all right so uh, this force decompose it into the components of uh, your f of x times some some unit vector your f of y times some unit vector in the y direction plus uh, f of uh, z times some uh, unit vector in the z direction which is k this with the hat okay so similarly if you are looking at r which is the position right 
uh, in three dimensional we just say that r is just basically your uh, x position and some unit vector in that direction your y vector and uh, your y position and your uh, unit vector in the y direction and uh, your z position and the unit vector in the uh, z direction okay so just by this relationship you know if you are taking a small uh, infinitesimal uh, change in r then that essentially would be a small change in x and uh, that would be a small change in y and that would be a small change in your z direction which is written by dz yeah okay so here remember we are taking the dot product of f dot dr so if we do the dot product between these two vectors we know that uh, in dot product i dot i will be 1 and all these cross terms i dot j i dot k will be 0 okay so if you do f dot dr basically you are left with uh, your terms of fx uh, dx and uh, f of y dy and f of z dz okay and this is f of z right this is not f times y okay so just be careful i can rewrite it just uh, to make it more uh, accentuated that way f of x okay and uh, so this is your term f dot dr just uh, your dot product between these two vectors okay and um, now what you can do is you can substitute this in the formula here so you have u will be minus of infinity dot uh, r and then you will get your f of x dx term and then you will have another uh, minus infinity to r your f of y dy term and uh, you have uh, minus infinity to r and f of uh, z dz okay so that is your potential energy term right so again here what you're doing is when you're doing f of x dx essentially all you have is your uh, x values okay and here all you have is the y values and all you have here is your z values right so you have uh, essentially uh, isolated the components in the x y and z direction okay so if i take a partial derivative okay so let me take a partial derivative that is i am only uh, taking the derivative with respect to x okay so what that would mean is if i take the derivative of this f of z term or f of uh, sorry this should be f of y so if i take the derivative of this f of y term or f of z term this will be zero right because i am only uh, differentiating with respect to x okay. so in that case uh, all i will get is i'll get the first term and I'm taking the uh, derivative. So I'll uh, lose this integral sign. And what I get is I just get the term of f of x. Okay. And similarly, you can say that uh, if I take uh, du by dy, which is partial derivative, then I will get uh, your f of y. Okay. And uh, similarly, I can take the partial derivative of with respect to uh, z, and then you will get f of z. Okay. And uh, there is a negative sign here, so it should be minus f of x minus f of y and minus f of z okay or more generally it is written that the force is a negative of du by dx right this way and uh, of course you can write it in f of y f of z also and so what this means is that the force is negative of the gradient of your potential energy okay so that is what we have realized is the relationship between your potential energy and your force okay so again uh, these three they are partial derivatives is uh, we only uh, want to differentiate with respect to one variable and essentially we are saying that the others are constant okay and uh, i can give you an example of how we deal with partial derivatives suppose you have a room like uh, the room you are sitting in probably and you want to find the temperature variation in that room okay so suppose uh, you want to find the temperature at the center position of the room okay so uh, mathematically what you can do is you can start moving along the x direction in the room and then uh, you forget about the y and z direction then you can just move along the y direction in the room and then you can just walk around the z direction in the room and eventually you will reach the uh, reach the center of the room okay so that kind of translation where you are first moving in x then moving in y then moving in z is just this example of what you are doing with partial derivatives that you are first moving in x direction keeping y and z constant then you are moving in the y direction keeping the other variables constant and uh, that way you can uh, progress in your problem and figure out how the temperature is varying 
along that path you are taking okay so and let's look at the example of the spring okay so in spring we had already found out last time that the potential energy term is 1/2 kx square right so uh, in the case uh, that we are talking about here that uh, if i want to find the derivative of this let me take the derivative du by dx right and i get the derivative as 1/2 is constant and k is another constant right which is my spring constant and i have taken the derivative of this i'll get 2 times x right so that means all i'm doing is i'm getting du by dx is essentially this 2 and 2 will cancel so i will get this kx right and remember in the case of the spring we always said that the force exerted by the spring is minus kx right so now you can see right how the force and this uh, gradient of uh, potential energy is related right that the force is essentially minus du by dx right this is the same relationship that we have just proved in the previous slide okay so uh, you can take the case of gravity as well remember in gravity we talked about uh, your potential energy being mg times some value y which is the distance in the y direction right and uh, if i take the derivative of this which is du by uh, dy now so i will get basically m times g and dy by dy will be 1 and now again i know that the force exerted by the gravity was uh, your uh, minus mg right because if i am moving uh, from position 1 to position 2 so i am moving uh, away uh, from where the gravity is wanting to move the particle right so that the gravity will exert a negative force and uh, now again in the same case we have that the force exerted by the gravity right is negative of this uh, differential of the function of your potential energy okay so uh, that's a very important relationship to remember of how force and your potential energy are related to one another okay we have talked about uh, your dot product and your cross product and uh, there are some terms that you should be familiar with when you are doing uh, three dimensional analysis so we will be talking about terms like gradient divergence and curl okay so the gradient is essentially a function that um, and it is this weird uh, looking uh, function okay which is uh, your i uh, the unit vector and partial derivative with respect to x and then plus j uh, of this uh, unit vector in the y direction and partial derivative of uh, y and then k which is in the z direction partial derivative of z okay if you are uh, finding the gradient of any function so gradient of any function t would be i which is a unit vector t by dx of that function so t is a function we are taking and then uh, it will be j and then partial derivative of the function with respect to y and uh, k partial derivative uh, with respect to your z okay so we'll talk about what this gradient means and uh, we'll do a short example to to help you understand what this is okay